City School District School Board meeting, January 31st, 2023. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Trustee Kelly. Here. Trustee Anjenga. Here. Trustee Adesobi. Present. Trustee Gale. Here. Trustee Lency. Here. Trustee Kerwin. Here. Trustee Red. Present. Trustee White. Present. President Saunders. Here. We have roll call. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Uh, we have changed our We've changed our um, our board meeting up for um, for tonight. So we have a presentation to start off with, and uh, then we'll go into public comics. I'm going to read something first. Yesterday, City Comptroller Morton stated that the city quote has not collected approximately $11.7 million of, the, of, the, of that amount that is currently passed due to the school district, end quote. The city has not filed required audits since 2015 that would show that monies were collected. Other representatives from the city have stated that there is no feasible path for the city to pay the school district. So to be clear, the city owes the school district $11.7 million with another $13 million coming. There was no payment strategy offered. So here's the school board's perspective. The city of Mount Vernon needs help from our state legislators to pay the school debt. The lack of these resources prevents the school district from providing much needed services for our students. So we're gonna have a, um, a slide for, uh, for our audience. Dr. BC. everyone. I am Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Bennett Conroy. Thank you for taking the time to be here. The presenters for this evening are myself, Ken Silver, Assistant Superintendent for Business, and Mr. Tom Scapoli, a member of our legal counsel. I would like to take this moment to especially acknowledge any of our legislative representatives union representatives, parents, leaders, and community representatives. As you are aware, the Mount Vernon City School District has been identified as one of the districts in fiscal stress. This presentation brings awareness as to the reason why serious financial challenges for the schools are ahead. So, the basic outline, as you can see there, begins with a 
11.7 million dollars is owed to us to the schools, which is past due. 18.8 million additional is owed over the next 18 months. We sue the city over past due taxes, giveaway developer deals. Financial challenges are ahead for the schools. We need the support of our community and state officials. As I move to the next slide, I'm going to ask Mr. Scapoli, who will take the next slide. Thank you. All right, so let me start by saying during the 2018, 19, and 1920 school year, Tom, the, speak into the, the city, um, hello? Oh, okay. Is that better? Sorry. Uh, during the 2018, 19, and 1920 school year, uh, the city was responsible for collecting school district taxes. And up until that point, the school budget was fairly consistent. Uh, so the tax payments from the city to the school district were very predictable. And uh, during that time period, the treasurer noticed that the tax payments that uh, were historically made were, were not being made the way they, they had been historically. They were uh, coming in later, and they were coming in with less money. So at the time, the school district approached the city and said, hey, we think you're shorting us on some of these, uh, these tax remittances. And the city denied that and said, absolutely not. We don't owe you any money. School district said, OK, uh, and filed a lawsuit. Uh, in the context of the lawsuit, the, city said, uh, the, school, uh, the school district said, uh, you're a public entity. Show us your books. right? Show us the taxes that you collected, and show us how much you paid to us and show us that you paid us everything that you were supposed to. At that time, the city said, OK, you're right. We owe you $11.7 million. So the school district said, great. Now let's sit down and discuss a repayment plan. The city said, I'm sorry. We don't have any money. We can't pay you. Uh, and we have no feasible way of trying to pay you over the near future. School district said, OK. That's really not acceptable to us. Uh, we've got to educate students. We need to uh, pay our staff members, pay our teachers. Uh, we've got to buy books and instructional supplies. So we need to find a better path forward. Uh, as a result, we are here today asking the legislators to pay, uh, to give money to the city so the city can pay the school district the money that it owes us. So, what is very clear, as of right now, the city owes the school district $11.74 million, and that money is past due. That is money that should have already been paid to the school district. Now, if you could just flip to the next slide. With that as a backdrop, there's additional monies that are going to be coming due soon. During the, in light of the, the district's problems in getting the tax dollars from the city during the 1819 and 1920 school year, during the 2021 school year, the school district decided to collect its own taxes. And just so you're aware, historically, uh, there's about $6 million in uncollected taxes each year. As I said, the tax payments are, are pretty predictable. So it's roughly about $6 million each year that doesn't get paid. Uh, and, and under the real property tax law, the city is required to make the district whole for those uncollected taxes. Uh, keep in mind there's a two-year lag in that, right? Uh, so each year the city is paying the school district $2 million of taxes that weren't collected from two years earlier. The city has not paid the school district in two years. Uh, the, city, the school district again approached the city representatives and said, look, you're not making your, your payment obligations, you guys need to make us whole for uncollected taxes. The city representatives at the time said, absolutely not. You're collecting your own taxes. We have no obligation to pay you anything. We showed the, the city representatives the statute that says in clear black and white, the city has to make the school district whole. Uh, now the city is claiming that it needs a board resolution to certify the unpaid taxes, and then they will pay the school district for uh, the uncollected taxes. So to be clear, we've got 11, uh, or we'll get there. Uh, we've got 11.74 million that's already due. We've got another 5.9 million 
uh, according to the school district's independent auditors, that are going to be due this spring. Uh, and we've got another $7.8 that will be due in the spring of 2024. Uh, and mind you, the city has told us that they can't pay any of it. Okay. Now, while the city is withholding millions of dollars in tax payments to the school district, uh, at the same time it is also giving away millions of dollars in school tax exemptions to wealthy developers. And the way that they're doing that is through what we call pilot agreements. Pilot is an acronym for payment in lieu of taxes. And uh, through the Mount Vernon Industrial Development Agency, whenever the city or the IDA gives these uh, tax exemptions to developers, that shifts the tax burden to all the other taxpayers in the school district. The school district has, uh, has approached the city and the IDA and said, look, we understand, well, first we've sued them because they're not complying with the general municipal law. Uh, and, and then we've approached the city and said, look, we understand the need for development. We understand that's important to the life of the city. Uh, but we really need you to do it responsibly. And if you're going to give out school tax exemptions, at least give us a seat at the table. At least allow us to sit there and be part of the discussion uh, about giving away school tax exemptions. The city has absolutely refused to give the school district a say in the tax exemptions that are given to the wealthy developers. So if we switch to the next slide, this is just an example of, of these pilot agreements. And, and I just I want to be clear that the numbers uh, are based on their documents. These are not my numbers, okay? So uh, their, own, their own papers uh, in support of the pilot agreement indicate that the property was worth $10 million before the developer bought it. And that $10 million property was making tax payments of $475 million. The developer came in and told the, the IDA that he was going to, uh, to spend $47 million constructing five apartment buildings and those five apartment buildings would consist of 179 market rate apartments. To be clear, that's not affordable housing, it's not low income, it's not senior housing, it's market rate housing. So by my estimation, that property should be paying $1.1 $1 .1 million. Uh, but instead, under the pilot agreements, that taxpayer is paying $184,000. So they took a $10 million property added $37 million to it, and reduced their tax payments by half. Again, all of that, that tax exemption now gets shifted to the other taxpayers in the school district. Uh, I think it's important to note, when we look at the papers that were filed in connection with that application, they actually did a financial projection based upon uh, an assumed value of $13 million. And, if, and even if you assume that the developer spent $37 million to construct a building that was only worth $13 million, that property would still be paying over $600,000 in, in taxes. Uh, but again, under this pilot agreement, they're paying $184,000 and, and at least, at a minimum, $400,000 in school taxes is being shifted to the other taxpayers of the district. So again, uh, we've approached the city, and we've explained to the city that unlike the city budget, the school voters have to adopt, they have to approve the school budget. And it's very difficult for the school district uh, if, if the city is pushing all of that tax burden onto the voters. Uh, and I think uh, now Ken Silver will be here and he'll talk a little bit about, uh, about the impact that this is having on the district. Thank you and good evening everyone. So where are we after all of this and all these speakers? Our fund balance is almost gone. Our fund balance, which should be 10 or $11 million, is now down to $1 million. We're owed essentially $25 million that has not been collected or received, 11.7 right now. By the end of this year, it could up, go up to $30 million if we have not received anything in some way from the state or the city. What we, what we will owe what we are owed will exceed 10% of our budget pretty soon. So 
That has affected our cash. That has affected our ability to provide programs. That will affect our ability next year to have programs to compete with our neighbors. Our wealthy neighbors are constantly having new innovations. We can't do that the way things stand. We will have to do no better than what we're doing now. We will not be able to have new programs. We are in the process now of cutting back on textbooks for next year. So we may have to use old textbooks because we don't have enough money. The controller spoke to our fiscal situation. Make no mistake. If we had the tax money that was due to us, the $11.7 million, we would not be in any fiscal distress at all. We would not even be on their radar, let alone be one of the worst in the state right now. We are the only ones in the state who have taxes outstanding from the municipality that haven't been paid. One of our neighbors that collects taxes at the end of the year, when they submit it to the, the city, the city provides it to them the next day, the taxes that are outstanding. We have also had to put off repairs. We had $2 million in this year's budget to do major capital projects and repairs. We have now had to stop that. We have to make sure that we have enough money to get through this year. The superintendent has frozen the budget for this year, and only absolutely necessary expenses will be used for this year. We have to be very careful for next year of what's going to happen. We don't know that we're going to have an increase in state aid. We just don't know that yet. We hope we will, but we don't know that. And without any assurance that this tax money will come, we just don't know where we're going to be. Conceivably, jobs could be lost if we don't have the money to make the budget work. Typically, four to five million dollars is used from fund balance, from our savings, to make the budget match so that we don't have to increase taxes any more than we have to. We don't have that this year. We don't have it now, and we don't have it next year as of this time. So what comes next? We're calling on our state legislators to do something to help us. The best way for us, according to our accountants, is if the state gives the money to the city of Mount Vernon, and they owe the money back to the state, rather than the state giving us the money and we owing the money back to the state. Then they could just give us our tax money, and we're whole for the years uh, going back to th three years ago. So we're hoping that there will be legislation. There is some sort of a rescue program in, at the state level to help school districts and municipalities that are in fiscal trouble. But we're not in fiscal trouble because of us. We're in fiscal trouble because of the city and the management of the controller's office during the time that these problems took place and currently now. So we collect our own taxes. This, someone said the other day that we haven't collected as well as the city did. That's not true. We collect over 95% of our taxes in the past two years, at least as good as the city, or maybe better. So we are now just finishing our tax collection major part for the year, and we expect it to be the same. But there still will be, come June, five or six million dollars unpaid taxes. That will go into the coffer too. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it will then go up to 30 million dollars if we haven't received anything from the city by that time. Not all do at that time, but that will be the number that our auditors next year will put in. And our, our auditor, Scott, is going to be speaking to that subject in a few minutes, and he will be showing that the city now owes us $25 million for two years ago and the period in the past, which included the $11.7 million. Your help is critical. Uh, we are asking that you organize in some way and help us to fight back. Help us to go to our legislators. Help us to insist that the, that the monies that are due to us are paid. We have a large number of employees who live in this municipality. If we had to cut back on employees, it would hurt the residents of this community if we did not have our tax money. So we, we are counting on you to help us. And we hope that this uh, presentation is of some help in your understanding where we are. Thank you. What did you say, Don? Hey, the kids that money. Hey, the kids that money. Thank you, everyone, for this. If you have any questions, you can ask us later. So we'll go right into community. Um, no, the audit. Audit. Oh, the audit report. We're going to do community. We're going to do community, and then we'll get the audits. 
That's her report. <coughs> There is no legal requirement to recognize public comment at meetings of the Board of Education. However, the Board recognizes the critical importance of community discourse and involvement in the education of Mount Vernon's children, and accordingly, members of the public are invited to speak at each regularly scheduled Board meeting subject to the terms of the Board policy. A speaker must register in advance by no later than 4 p.m. the day of the meeting by contacting the district clerk in person at 165 North Columbus Avenue, Mount Vernon, New York, by phone at 914-665-335, or by email. The board welcomes all respectful comment, whether praise or criticism. However, identifying and criticizing a specific student, parent, teacher, administrator, or other Mount Vernon education official or employee is strictly prohibited. Any such complaint must be presented and addressed through a proper administrative channels. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to speak. Up to one additional minute may be used for the speaker to summarize and conclude their remarks. If appropriate, board trustees and or the superintendent or other staff members at the direction of the superintendent may immediately respond to a speaker's remarks. Our first speaker tonight is Jerry Lorde. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. My name is Geraldine Lorde, and I am a proud member of the Mount Vernon Parent and Community Forum on Education. And I am pleased to be here with you this evening to talk about a very important event that will be happening on the second Monday in February which is a part of Black History Month, and that's called Parent Involvement Day. I only have three minutes, so I'm going to try to get through it really quickly, but what I really want to know, want to know at the end of what I'm saying tonight, that you're making a pledge that you're going to be there, and not only are you going to be there, but you're going to tell other people to be there. Because in light of what's going on in all these areas, parent involvement is more important than ever. Teachers, the administrators, the school board, they cannot do this alone. We, the children are already two years behind because of the pandemic. And if they were already behind, where are your children now? But we have designed a day with you in mind and your village. You have aunts, you have uncles, you have grandmothers, you have grandfathers. You have somebody that can come into your child's school and see the wonderful things that are going on. Our principals, our staff, and our students are waiting for you to be there because they know when their parents come how special it is to show you what they're doing. Our superintendent, Dr. B.C., is right behind us. The forum brought this back because of the efforts of the school board. They allowed us to go. And this event was started by Joseph Doolin because he said, if you're going to be in my school, you're, you must. Now you can if you want to, if you feel like it, if you have time, but you or some or your representative, your aunt or uncle, must come to my school and participate in your children's education because we can't do this. And that means that you will be informed about what's going on in your school and what is going on with your child. So for us to say we don't have time is ridiculous. Do you know that years ago when I was teaching, um, there was a program that they told me that they were building, uh, they were building prisons based on second and third grade reading scores. Who are those prisons being built for? Uh, I'm not going to say it, but I'm letting you know. <laughs> Whether we go there or not, if your children are behind by third grade, if they haven't learned how to redo phonics and haven't actually gotten that practice down, how are they going to go on? Because they're stumbling and stuttering, and they're not going to pass them. So it's our responsibility. I'm excited because I taught for 35 years in the New York City school system. And it's always been my heart's desire to see parents coming out and supporting the efforts of the people, many of these teachers who are sitting in this room. You can't say you don't have time. You don't have time 
If you don't have time, my children will not be So I'm urging each one of you to come out. We have a day where you will have food. You'll be able to visit your children's classrooms. There will be workshops that will help you to work with your children. Thank you, Dr. BC. You're going to see on the doors of our school posters in English, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in German. You're going to, have, you're going to be welcome. You're going to have food. But most importantly, we want everybody to know we need you. You are welcome in our school. We need you to make this pledge with us. And I'm going to make copies of these because this was a pledge that Joe Julian put together. Not only are you going to come on the 13th, but you're going to come as many times as you can to our school. You're going to commit to help your children with their homework. If you are letting your child do his work all by himself, you don't know what's going on, that's sad. I can't go to the school. That is sad. So we want you to pledge that you value your children's education, you value partnering with our schools, our principals, and our teachers, and when your children are Ms. reading third grade, Miss Lorde, your time My is time up. My time is up? Yes. Even a four minutes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is our next speaker is Jerrian Albaranga. Good evening, everyone. So. I'm here this evening representing parents, and I'm a PTA president for one of the schools. The reason why I'm here today is um, extracurricular activity in the schools. One of the things that's very lacking right now, and I, I just update, I was I was informed that there will be there were programs that were approved, but there is a need for our students to have extracurricular activity. I know there's an emphasis in academics, but it's not all it. Now, all kids are strong academically, and we all know kids need a well-rounded education. They need sports. They need all the other amenities that are available to them. Now, um, from a, as a working parent, I know what it's like. Yes, I have the luxury to work from home, but you know what? I'm paying for extra activities outside of the school district for my kids. They get out of school at 3.15. I'm home with them, but I'm working. You have loved ones that go to the hospital I work in IT. If there's a system down, they can't get your medications at the pharmacy, I'm called, I have to make a choice between working for the hospitals or taking my kid to soccer, basketball, or baseball. I know there are a lot of parents who are in this position. They face this issue every day. So we're asking the school district as well as Mount Vernon, can we work together and get this going? We need programs in the school for all our kids. They need access. We all know sports makes a big difference for them. It actually, it helps them academically. And not all kids, I know there's an emphasis in power hour, which is great. I heard our kids are behind two years. Yes, but you know, we all know what works. Social media is crazy right now. As an IT person, my kid, he gets home at 3.15, I'm working. He's on the computer. I, I looked at everything. I have everything you could think of in place. I have to keep up to date with technology because of what I do for a living. My son, it's amazing how to get around. He's in seventh grade. He does everything. I said, you're not allowed to go on these websites because it's not age appropriate. And trust me to get around it. On the school district device, I actually purchased my own laptop for him because I didn't want it. I wanted to have control. And I was told the school had issues with my personal laptop. So I had to give him back a school device. But I have to actually go into registry now. Anyone in IT knows what I'm talking about because he knows how to go on install and uninstall the stuff that he's not supposed to be playing that I said to him, absolutely not. So I can just imagine for a parent who doesn't have that knowledge and the skill set to track their kids and know what they're doing, but we all know you put them in sports, you put them in all these other activities, it's less time for them to be in social media. My neighbor, recently, back in October, there were two boys try to break into her house at 3.15 in the afternoon. I know they're school kids. It's on her ring camera. She was calling me to say someone is trying to break into her house. When I look at the video, it was two, their two school-age kids. The police got involved. They were notified. But from what I saw in that video, 
it seems that they were making a TikTok video. No, you get in that neighbor's house. Imagine what could happen. You're trying to break into her house just to be on TikTok. But these are some of the things our kids are doing. And we need to do better as leaders. I'm asking, work together, figure it out, and help our kids. They need more activity so they can stay off the street, less time on social media, and this is the only thing that's going to work. We know it is tried and true. It worked in the past. My closing argument, I've heard this catchphrase, and I'm saying catchphrase, this one mile burning. We're not naive. We know it's not one mile burning. We need our leaders to work together, figure it out, and stop saying one mile burning until it actually is one mile burning, because it's not. Thank you. Our next speaker, Shundea Lyon. Shundea Lyon. Janice Poland. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. My name is Janice Pollard. I'm here as the MVFT Union Representative for Pennington School. MVFT members continue to have ongoing payroll issues, some of which began before the 2022-2023 school year. MVFT members continue to have incorrect deductions every pay period, resulting in being paid incorrectly. I come to you tonight with a few questions. Did you know that we have been late with monthly bills and have accrued late fees? Now we've all had to make calls regarding bills in our lives and we all know that the person on the other end of the phone isn't very empathetic. Did you know that tax season is upon us and we are bringing incorrect information to our accountants? Why is it fair that our tax returns continue to be affected? Did you know that MVFT members have been in the process of buying new homes? And since payroll issues exist, those members are not enjoying the first time home buyer joy. How about those who have had births, weddings, and other life events? They have been worried. Am I going to get paid correctly this pay period? The holidays came and went, many not being able to enjoy as they may have in the past. Did you know that MVFT union reps have spent countless hours listening to our members in tears about how payroll has affected their lives and mental health? But did you really know that MVFT members still show up and give our all? We still show the same professionalism and love for our students and families, even though we aren't paid correctly. Did you know that we still go above and beyond, even though we are paid incorrect? Do you know that we still use our own money for supplies and materials, even though we are paid incorrectly. We have lost trust. We feel unappreciated and ignored. To say the least, we ask, what's taking so long to make payroll corrections? Do they care? Do we matter? We're not asking for anything except for what we're entitled to. Put yourselves in our shoes and fix what should have never happened. Thank you. Our next speaker, Dolores Mack. I came out tonight, you know, first I want to give an honor to uh, Dr. B.C., trustees, administrators in the community here. Um, born and raised in this great city at one time. I'm annoyed 
I really am annoyed with this. I thought, you know, each election from the school board trustees and the city officials that the main thing, we're going to work together. We're going to share in this and that. That bothers me. Um, I want to ask this board, you know, have y'all done your homework? Because, you know, we had all the stimulus money. Did Where's that at? And I know CSEA is not getting none of it. Let me take this down. The CSE workers got none of the stimulus money here at the Board of Education. I know that. Um, and why are you using your operation money for capital? Um, and did, I know a little bit about politics. I'm not an official, just a district leader for 47 years in, in Mount Vernon, but I've been to numerous meetings and see how city government works and the school board, because my first school board meeting was here in 1976. Oh. Um, we got to look at the school board in the city. Y'all need to really sit at a round table because what y'all doing is hurting the taxpayers. I know too many senior citizens here on a fixed income who's trying to hold on to their houses. And that's who y'all hurting, and especially the most valuable resources are our children. Our children. I mean, y'all got to do better than what y'all doing because it's both ends. There's two sides to a story. But there's both ends. And like I said, I'm so sick and tired. I've been in the politics for 47 years here in the city. And I'm sick and tired of hearing, oh, well, you know, we're going to work together, the school board in the city. I don't, I don't see that from this newspaper article today. I don't see that. It's, it's not getting any good. So y'all got to get your house in order, and the city of Mount Vernon got to get their house in order. Because I'm sick and tired of our... Uh, personal problems is in the paper because the journal news eats up on this, especially when it comes to the city of Mount Vernon. They eat us up with this, and this doesn't look good. So y'all got to get your house in order, and the city does too. Thank you. But what I want to know at the end, too, about the stimulus money and why the CSEA workers didn't get their part and stuff, and what are y'all doing? You know, me being active in the city and in the school board, too, I sit on negotiation teams. I'm a retiree from the school board. I did 28 years in the district. I retired in 2013. But y'all got to get yourself together. And um, I want to know about the stimulus money. Where's that at? Because over the decades, grants for this, grants for that. And we shouldn't be in this position. Thank you. Our next speaker, Darren Martin. He's in the room. come forward. Uh, good, good evening. So, I want to start off first of all by saying that the Office of the Comptroller um, is ready and is um, willing. The Office of the Comptroller is ready and willing to work with the school district as I have since I took office in January 1, January 1, 2022. So let me try to make sure that we make sure that we all leave here with factual information. We agree that there is $11.7 million of unpaid taxes to the city, to the school district for 2017 to 2019. We agree. Also, what also should be noted is that prior to my taking office, Deborah Reynolds, the former comptroller, failed to relevy the taxes or to receive the taxes. And so since I've been in office, we've been working with the attorneys to come up with the exact amount, which is how we got to the $11.7 million, right? Currently, as of today, in the system, there is 460 properties that have unpaid school taxes for those years, mounting to about $11 million, dollars ten point seven and to be exact. So it's not money that is missing, it's money that is unpaid. And it's unpaid because of the financial dysfunction that was going on in the city prior to of course my taking office. The best pathway forward to collect that money is for us to 
issue out the arrears notices to every taxpayer, which we aim to do in February to receive that money from them. <coughs> now, the school district is well aware that there is a two-year span. And so because the taxes have not been collected, at the mark of that two years, then the city is supposed to pay the school district the amounts that are unpaid. Well, the amounts that are unpaid are $11 million, in which the city does not have a reserve, just like the school district does not have a reserve. But the money is not missing. It is just unpaid, according to the system. Now, that's the $11.7 million um, issues, which we are going to work with the school district to ensure that we will receive those monies from the taxpayers as expeditiously as we possibly can. The system is broke. Let's be, let's be real about it. Because the expectation was that the school district, that the city, would have a reserve to pay it. When the city does not have a reserve to pay what is unpaid, they cannot pay. As it pertains to the taxes that the school district collected from 2020, to 2022, it was not until December 13th that I received a PDF listing of those taxes that had been unpaid. If the city was to collect the taxes and would owe it to you next month, that list should have been to me, to our office, by February of 2021. It was 22 months late and it was uncertified. Here is a copy of the letter that Maureen Walker used to issue to the school board for the school board to sign off on and certify in accordance to the real estate property tax law that requires a certification. So once I receive a certification from the school district, the school board, I will begin to collect those taxes. But now the question is, does the clock for two years start now when it should have started in February of 2021. So here's what we have to do, work together. And I'm willing to stay, sit with you and figure out how can we pay these taxes that are unpaid. We have to come up with a strategy okay. to do this. That's all that I'm asking because I wanted to make sure that you understood it is not that we were holding it. The money has not been collected. And now we need to collect it together. And we can do this together, if you wish. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Our next speaker is Ronan Mitchell. Ronan Mitchell. Good evening. Good evening. CSCA in the building, Federation of Teachers, God bless y'all. Because y'all are the strength that keeps this district as strong as it is. Building leads and principles as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate every last one of you. Even if I don't know your name, you don't know me. Um, I was on this board. We've been discussing the fund balance situation for years. And we know that it's been dwindling for years. For us to say and announce, I'm not, I'm not uh, defrauding or battling that the city doesn't owe us taxes, because it's true. We know that, and we've been knowing this for years now. This is not new. But to say that we're in fiscal crisis, we knew that we were on, this, on the way here. We knew since at least last year. The report came out last year, and we were low level, if I'm not mistaken. So we knew where we were going with this. But let me say this. $11 million, $300 million worth of repairs, with 52 some odd million of it, priority ones and twos across buildings in our district. $11 million, I'm not sure what we're supposed to imagine $11 million is supposedly causing us to be in fiscal stress, but I don't think that that should make sense to anybody. 
But yet, when we talk about fiscal responsibility, I sat on that board and I did my best to exercise responsibility for everything that I was a part of. But let me say this, fiscal responsibility, there's a resolution right now on the board, on the, on the docks tonight, to spend $100,000 to audit grants. What's the timing on that? Is anybody paying attention to the timing? Nobody had a question about grants and auditing grants in years. All of a sudden, we have a new superintendent and grants come into the conversation, and now we need $100,000 for auditing of grants. Not $100,000 to fix the crumbling conditions of Williams that I visited and spoke on, because everybody wanted to know where my energy was. I spoke on the conditions at Williams as my committee report sitting on that board. I spoke on the conditions at the Cecil Parker Playground and the rest of the playgrounds in the district while sitting on the board. I spoke on the Denzel Washington repairs that have been ticketed since at least 2016 that have been removed from the ticket system and never fixed. But yet, we have $100,000 to audit grants out the blue. $900,000 to give CSCA some money that they need to try and meet their means to survive after spending all these years. Not $100,000 towards the bigger goal, which is to give Federation of Teachers to let them know that they respected and appreciated in this district. Let me say, nobody's going to keep a job in this district and nobody's going to want to come here if this type of politics nonsense continues to go on. I tried to do what I could on the board. If I ever get the chance again, you better know that I'm going to do it again. I'm going to tell you that right now. But I want people to really pay attention to the timing on things. Here we are now hearing about this trying to throw rocks at the city. We need partnering between the city and the school district for this city to heal. That's all it is. We have to partner, not divisively drive wedges in between the people, the district, and the city. It's not going to help anything. All it's going to do is continue the narrative that Mount Vernon is broken and dysfunctional to every other district and our na that neighbor us. Every other district, and they already do. Every other district in our neighboring area has increased taxes accordingly. What makes you think that the reason we're in financial distress is because we haven't raised taxes more than 1.5% over the last eight years? And one, who has been driving taxes to never be increased, and why? And don't get me wrong, I own property in this, in, this, in this city, so does my mother. And I understand uh, being in distress trying to make sure you just got your meds money. But I'm going to promise you this, if we don't care about these babies, because all of these decisions that I'm seeing being made, $100,000 for a grant, I don't see where the babies is being thought about, ever. I haven't seen that happen in months. All right? So that's my time, because here's security. Thank you. God bless. Uh, our next speaker, Keith McCall. What's that lady's security going to do? She can't do nothing. Good evening, everyone. My name is Keith McCall. I'm the president of the Mount Vernon Federation of Teachers. And I'm here this evening to stand before the board to let you know that our over 1,200 members are ready for a new collective bargaining agreement. We have been working under the Triborough Law, which says that if an existing contract is expired, we just work under the current contract. Our collective bargaining agreement expired on June the 30th of 2022. And it's very important that we start contract negotiations. Number one, our teachers, our teaching assistants, and our security monitors, we are the lifeblood of this school district. Without us, nothing happens. Our salaries need to be nego uh, renegotiated now because um, but, uh, new teachers need to be recruited. If they look at our existing salary schedule, they might not want to come to Mount Vernon. Also, we need to retain our existing teachers who are in the middle of their careers. Um, if you look at, at the trends over the past couple of years, we have a lot of high quality educators who are leaving our district to go right next door to neighboring districts because Mount Vernon is not competitive. 
Now, as teachers, we know that we, we always have to be flexible when it comes to certain things, and we are willing to be flexible. We're, we're just asking that we begin the process. Uh, back in December, um, our, our NYSET lawyer has contacted the district saying that we are willing to negotiate. Um, to my knowledge, as of right now, we've had no communication um, from the district saying that the process will begin. So we stand here tonight, 1,200 strong, saying, let's start the process. Now, I have, I've had conversations with the superintendent today um, because over the weekend I received a lot of messages saying that our district was in significant uh, financial stress. So we did have conversations about that. We are willing to do our part in terms of um, using our political influence um, to persuade the, um, the legislators to give us money so that we can fix whatever needs to be uh, fixed so that we can move forward and so that the children can get the high quality education that they deserve. It begins with the teachers, the teachers, the teaching assistants, and our security monitors who keep us safe as well. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Our next speaker is Yuri White. Good evening, Dr. B.C., President Sanders, Vice President Wanda White, and all the um, cabin members and the rest of the trustees. Um, I'm here tonight for a couple of reasons. I'm here, first of all, in reference to um, a rumor that was going around stating that there's some stipends that's supposed to be pulled tonight on the tab. So there was a rumor going around saying I'm the reason why they're being pulled. So I just want to put it in the air. I had nothing to do with those stipends being pulled. I didn't even know they was being pulled. The people was calling me letting me know they was being pulled. That was not my decision. That was civil service decision because the positions and the stipends was created without the unions, um, without their permission, and they was given to the people, which... I had nothing to do with that. So when civil service found out, they said that they was going to pull them. And I guess they pulled them, which had nothing to do with me. So I wanted to clear that up. There's stipends, the same stipends, I believe, is in the tabs tonight. And they still have not been negotiated with the union. So they should not go through tonight. It was also a position that was created that was never negotiated with the union. That should not go through tonight because it needs to be discussed with the union first. You have to respect our contract and have respect... It should be discussed with the executive board first before we create positions and give them to people. My um, also concern is we're having problems with there's some confusion with how we're supposed to be doing the hiring for our department. Uh, what is the process? It's so mixy. It's, I, I've never even seen it before. It's just crazy how the process of the hiring is being done for our department. It's mixy how they're being evaluated the process of that with our members of how they're being, when they're on probation, who is interviewing them, who is evaluating them, is so mixy. My other issue is payroll. When we, we got paid on the 13th the other day. I went to the bank every day trying to get money, and one day I went there. They said, it'll be there the next day. I said, okay. Most of the members, staff throughout the district didn't get paid until the 19th after we was supposed to get paid on the 13th. And I went to get gas, and I couldn't even get gas because I had, that was my gas money that I used that count that the money going. And it was an insult. And then we had got an email previous weeks ago from the business department saying, if you have any payroll issues, contact, email this email. No one answered that email. No one answers the phone. Okay? And it's an insult that they think it's okay that you didn't get paid and you can't get your money, but they got their money. Right. And then they get an attitude with you when you come and you, when you call and you're frustrated. You want your money to tell you to come back, tell you to come back. We worked 
Can we just get paid on time? Yes, we need our money. Like y'all need your money. We 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 don't make the six figures most of us see CSCA, but we need our money too. It may be a little bit of money, but we still need it. So we're asking you guys to please, please do something with payroll. Please correct this problem and stop having attitude with the with the staff and the employees because they upset because they didn't get no money. We got mortgages, even though we probably shouldn't have them, but we do got more. We do got car payments. We do got kids. We got to pay bus fare. We got to pay college tuition. Our money got to be on time. And I just want to say, I hope that we can work this issue out with these stipends that's being created without consulting the union. And let's just respect each other respectfully. And I just want to tell all the trustees and the cabinet members that CSA is looking for you to support us on us closing our contract. Thank you. Have a good night. And that ends public comments. Reports of the superintendent. Good evening. Good evening again, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my first update in my superintendent report is that we have three Mount Vernon City School Scholars with scholarships from the um, MD MLK Legacy Youth Awards. And they are, the three folks are Rayanu Adams, Roy Michael Brisport, and Muhammadu Alu. Um, and if you are here, could you please come forward so that we can recognize you? and Roy Michael um, Brisport, 12th grade students at Mount Vernon Steam Academy, won the William L. Carter Perseverance Award, which includes a $2,000 scholarship. <laughs> Mohamedou Alou, 12th grade student at Mount Vernon High School, won the Social Action Award and a $2,000 scholarship. <laughs> In total, 14 awards were issued, 10 2,000 scholarships and 4 2,500 Albertine Bloom Scholarship Grant. So what I'm going to do, guys, I want you to congratulate them. I'm going to come down and give you guys a hug. But I also want them to say a few words on how they feel that day because I told you they were all dressed up nicely in their suits and they were hanging out with um, Councilman Bowman and the others. So guys, let's give, give them a round of applause, a standing ovation. <laughs> Oh. Hello? Oh, she just left us here. Um, <laughs> um, it was a great experience. Um, we're on stage. We got to see Councilman Jamal Bowman. Um, the check hit the account and it was very nice. Um, I just want to say that I said it in my speech there. Um, the most important people to get me here at this stage, um, of course, other than my parents, have been my teachers in the Mount Vernon City School District. So since they were here today, make sure to support them. Um, they really are the lifeblood of the district, and I wouldn't be here without them. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, boy. I don't have much to say. I'm not really prepared for this. I'm not going right. to lie. But I will say this again. Thank you for my teachers, everyone that supported me. And I will also like to say to stay. Y'all should um, appreciate them and give them what they deserve. Thank you again. Um, does this thing work? Yes. <laughs> uh, does this, okay, cool. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Roy Michael, and um, honestly, the experience was really good. I, uh, I'm honestly kind of feeling the exact same way that I was on stage. It's pretty nervous because everyone's looking at me, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm just really glad I was able to get that award, but more so I'm just really glad that I was able to give back to my community. I hope that I can continue giving back to all of you as well. I don't really have more. And this is what we're talking about, folks, that we have to celebrate our scholars when they do well. But I also want to say to the MVFT, we heard you, okay? Mm -hmm. But I also want to say, give thanks to Ms. Pope, the guidance counselor, you know, and the STEAM family. Where's the STEAM family? I thought I saw them tonight. Ooh. Will you please stand? <laughs> and uh, Ms. Pope just joined us lately. But she was one of them who selected, the guidance counselor who selected these young men for the scholarship. So we want to thank all, us, all, all, all our guidance counselors for looking out for our kids as we, you know, go along. So I want to congratulate you three young men. And we hope to bring you back during the recommitment of the um, MBK launching that we're going to do soon. And we will celebrate you a little bit better. But I just couldn't let this pass without congratulating you. You made us proud. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. While I'm here, let me just continue with my report. Um, I just also want to share with you that we just received $4 million in grants for mental health. And we are in partnership with the Mercy College. And we will be training guidance counselors and other people in our district. And while they are being trained in um, the whole atmosphere of um, giving service to our students, they will be getting a stipend. So you will hear some more about that as we go along. But we got that $4 million um, grant. We also want to say that next year, we are going to look at STEAM. I know the parents have been asking for a long time, what are you going to do to update STEAM a little bit more? And I have um, Mrs. Morales here in the audience. Come up, Mrs. Morales. I'm not going to do this without you. Come on up, come on up. But she's a principal for this year. And she's, and, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Ms. Ms. Morales is going to read and talk about what STEAM is going to look like next year, hopefully. It's not finalized yet, but she will. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry this is a surprise. We dressed on day to day in school, so I just want to see this, tell you that this is a plan that I have with uh, Dr. BC. We spoke for 20 minutes, and what we are trying to do with this thing is to go back to what STEAM was supposed to be when we opened in 2018. The STEAM Academy was supposed to be a school where a student, the majority of the students that go to STEAM, they take an assessment to make sure that they can take the courses that the school is supposed to offer. We offer a pathway in engineering, biomedical, and computer programming. The uh, emphasis is on math and science. And in order for you to have that, you have to have the student that can do the work. Gradually, we want to go back to that. Dr. BC have a lot of homework to do together with me. We're thinking of a testing, a start small this year for 23-24. I cannot give you any more details because we don't have everything finalized, but we want to start creating a STEAM Academy in Mount Vernon. 
So that way we have three schools that we serve every type of student that we have. Any questions? So on next Thursday, thank you, Ms. Morales. Huh? Oh, this Thursday, thank you, Mr. Um, Doggett. This Thursday, we're going to have um, school choice night. And you will hear more in detail about what STEAM is going to look like for next year. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to do our best to offer more challenging, more rigorous courses and pathway for our kids who want to excel in STEAM. And I have to say, I must give thanks to the trustees who have definitely been really working on that um, on the STEAM project, you saw Trustee Kerwin there nodding her head, you know, <laughs> because she knows that she has been a fighter with that. So thank you, Trustee Kerwin, for, for, for that. And, and, and more is going to come when it comes to that. I also want to thank the, our parents and um, community members, police department and safety team, for their responsible reporting of what goes on in the district. I remember when I um, became the superintendent first, I said to the people in the community, if you see something, say something. And I have to say that a lot of the parents in the community have reached out to the Mount Vernon City School District and, and said to us, this is happening. And uh, there was a particular incident that happened many weeks ago wherein that, um, you know, our students like to do, and I know one of the parents talk about the, the on the social media, and a lot of things were posted, like with guns and all of that was posted. And some parents jumped into action, made the phone call to the, to the administrators. The administrators made the phone call to me on a Saturday, and I, I, I alerted the, the, the trustees, but, and I, we alerted the police department, but they jumped into action, and we have that solved. But the thing about it, it goes far beyond that, because not only that the student was trying, they were trying to tell us something. And a lot of our kids in this community and adults, we, they have some mental challenges in terms of since the pandemic and they need help. And I think that is why this grant is so fitting for our community that we can train um, teachers, we can train counselors and give them a stipend to work with our students. And you know that mental health is big on my, on my agenda. Safety and security is big, but mental health is also big. So when you see people do things, sometimes kids are crying out for help. And sometimes adults are crying out for help. So we are going to work on that as best as we can. So I want to thank the community. And I want to thank the kids too, because you have students have come into my office and told me about things that are going to, to happen and be proactive. And I want to tell them, Keep on bringing this to the forefront because if you see something, say something and we will do something. And I always say to our, our kids when they try to test us, and, and I spoke to a group of them the other day, I said, oh, you're trying to test me, right? Because of the things that you're doing. Please don't test me because I will show up at your door and it's not to say hi and goodbye, <laughs> okay? We are going to have those conversations. You know, but it's not to penalize anybody, but we will show up because that student did not realize that we were going to show up, okay? So I'm just saying thank you to the community for partnering with us and for reaching out and, you know, sharing with us all the information that was necessary. And even when we have one of our little babies who, you know, went missing for a while, the community came together and did what they had to do. And I must say thank you to all the stakeholders who were involved in, in, in that. Our baby is safe and sound, but it's just the community effort that we pulled together. And lastly, we had February 13th, I know Ms. Lorde preached her gospel on parent, um, Yes, Involvement Day, we are looking forward to a big Parent Involvement Day where you could go in and talk to your teachers, talk to your principals, and, and, and um, have conversations. So at the Board of Ed, we are going to have tea with the superintendent in the afternoon, so any parent who want to stop by and come and chit-chat with me and my team in the afternoon, please stop by because we are open for you. So thank you so much, everyone. I know it's getting late. And... Um, have a pleasant evening.
Yeah. Yeah. Next is, Next is their annual audit presentation. Good evening, everyone. Huh? Okay. Uh, thank you all. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Oling. I am the partner uh, from PKF O'Connor Davies, who is a uh, partner in charge of the annual external audit that we conducted for the school district for the year that ended June 30th, 22. I'm joined here tonight by Mark Callanan, who was the senior manager on the audit, who, who really did all the work. I just get to speak about it tonight. Obviously, some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight were uh, you know, discussed earlier in this meeting. Uh, and so hopefully I could just add some uh, clarity uh, to that. So I have about a dozen slides to go through, uh, and some of these slides will include some of the financial information about the school district uh, for the year that ended June 30th of 22. So just for those who are in the audience or who might be watching uh, you know, at home, uh, a school district undergoes a lot of audits every year. Uh, you have an internal audit function uh, where uh, they work with the school board to identify what the internal auditor feels are the areas that are most risky from a financial point of view, and then they do a deep dive in those areas uh, to see uh, you know, whether any improvements uh, can be made. So you have an internal auditor who does that function. A school district is also required to have a claims auditor. So every bill that is paid by the school district, uh, non-salary related, goes through a claims auditor before it comes to the board for approval. Uh, that's the uh, school districts in New York. And then, of course, what our function is, is the external auditor, where we uh, are uh, tasked with uh, you know, auditing the numbers that you provide to us, making sure we are comfortable and that those numbers uh, fairly present uh, the financial results of operation for the school district during the year. And what's not included on here, of course, are any audits that the State Controller's Office might want to do or uh, the State Education Department might want to do. Next slide. Our responsibility in conducting the external audit, uh, we uh, conduct that audit under what's known as Generally Accepted Auditing Standards, or GAS. And we are required uh, to ensure that we design the audit to achieve reasonable not absolute assurance that the financial statements are free from what we call material misstatement. So obviously, as an auditor, we're not coming in here looking at every single transaction that the district has entered into during the year, but we design tests and, and we do sampling and, and do various things to give us reasonable assurance that the numbers that are going to appear in the audit report are, are reasonable. We're also tasked with communicating uh, to you, uh, the board, or uh, as we refer to you as those charged with governance of the school district, we're required to uh, communicate to you anything that we find as, as weaknesses in your systems that we review. And we have to essentially grade them, you know, since I'm at a school, into three categories. The most significant kind are what are known as material weaknesses, a middle grade would be significant deficiencies, and then minor, uh, you know, administrative type issues would be control deficiencies. Our audit has identified uh, in this audit four items that we do consider to be material weaknesses, and I will discuss those in a few minutes. Uh, we identified nothing as a significant deficiency, and then we have several minor control deficiencies, and I'll review these all on the tenth slide of this uh, um, 
presentation. We're also, towards the bottom there, required uh, under auditing standards, if we come across anything that we believe is fraudulent or illegal uh, in, during our audit, uh, we, you know, we have to stop immediately and communicate it to a level uh, within the organization here that we feel is appropriate. And usually that would be a level above where we think the problem is, obviously. So uh, we are happy to report that we did not come across any instances, any suspicions, or any allegations of fraud while we were doing our external audit. Other things that we are required to communicate with you. Uh, one of the good things that uh, you will see in your audit report is that we've issued an unmodified opinion on your financial statements. What does that mean? That's known as a clean opinion. Uh, it's really the highest form of assurance that an auditor provides a client. It basically says that we believe your audited financial statements fairly present what happened in the district financially uh, for the year ended, uh, you know, June 30, 22. We did have certain findings, as I mentioned, that we did deem material weaknesses, and, and we will uh, go over those in a few minutes. Uh, you also, because of the amount of federal aid that you receive, any entity that receives over $750,000 in federal aid in a given year has to have a federal compliance audit done in conjunction with the financial statement audit to make sure that the federal dollars are being spent in accordance with the way the feds want you to spend it. So they give us, you know, for each of the programs, different things to look for, and depending on the program that we choose, uh, we go through those and, and, and uh, examine those uh, programs, what was spent in those programs. There's a lot of estimates in the uh, audit report. Uh, you know, not every number is an exact number. Some, some are estimates. We, we review all the estimates that the school makes in putting the uh, numbers uh, for the financial statements together, and we found those to, uh, to be appropriate. We make uh, several audit adjustments during most audits. Uh, we give those adjustments to the, uh, the finance folks, and they have to agree with, with our findings and then book those, those adjustments into your uh, financial statements. We actually didn't have any difficulties in conducting the audit, you know, it, it, and you'll see some of my comments later on, but there were no unresolved matters. We worked back and forth to, to, to get to uh, the point where we felt comfortable issuing uh, an audit report. So now let's talk about the numbers. Uh, some of that was brought up, uh, you know, earlier uh, in tonight's meeting. So this is a very high-level summary of the school district's general fund. This is the fund that the voters vote upon every year uh, for your operations. And all of this information is provided in more detail on page 59 of the full audit report. So when we look at this uh, summary page, you see on the top that revenues for the district were originally estimated to come in at about $254.8 million from a variety of sources, property taxes, state aid, and various other revenues. That estimate was revised slightly during the year to just over $255.6 million. But what you see in the actual column is revenues only came in at $246.2 million. So those revenues or approximately, you could see in the variance column, approximately $9.3 million short of what you had planned when adopting uh, the budget for the 21-22 year that, that the voters approved. So I have a, a, a little highlight there. And you will see that there were really two primary drivers of the revenue shortfall compared to what you had expected. I think it's come up uh, you know, earlier tonight when, when this meeting started. Uh, property taxes came up $6.8 million uh, short of budgetary expectations this year. Now, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of that results from the fact that the $11.7 million that was due from 1920 and prior that normally would have been received by the school district this year did not come in. From an accounting point of view, if the property tax revenue does not come in, either from your own collections now that you're collecting your own, or the amount that the city owes you, it cannot be recognized as revenue until it is received. So even though you anticipated it, uh, you know, you were not made whole by the city as, as was discussed earlier, that impacts the amount of property tax revenue that's reflected here. And the net effect of older years, newer years, and, and all that was about a $6.8 million uh, shortfall. There was also a shortfall in state aid 
uh, what was estimated to be received in state aid and, and what actually came in. State aid was about $2.2 million short. We attribute some of this. Uh, certain aids, certain uh, uh, of your state aids, that there's a lot of categories of state aid that come to you. Some of them are based on prior year expenses. Of course, during the COVID years, some of those expenses did not occur. So obviously, the state reduces what they would pay you because you didn't incur those expenses. So that is a primary driver of why state aid came in short of your budgetary uh, expectation this year. So between those two items, everything else kind of came in as expected, and that was the primary driver for why revenues did not come into budget. On the flip side, and obviously, you know, those two things are really things that are out of the district's control, right? The collection of property taxes and, and getting the money and whatever the state's going to pay you is not really in your control. On the next line for expenditures, where the district originally expected to spend about $257 million, was revised during the year, the estimate, to about $261 million. You only spent, as you can see, $250.6 million. Now, there are some what we call encumbrances, certain purchase orders that roll over uh, to the next year because certain expenses just were not completed by the end of the year. So you can see in the variance column, you actually came in $9 million underspent. Those are things you control. Now, some of it's due to you know, vacancies in, in certain positions. Other things are other expenditure controls that, that, that are put into place to, to, you know, to, to save money for the district. So that was good news for the district, that the things under your control, you were able to come up with savings. So when we get to the bottom of the first column, the original budget column, you see a, a negative $5.7 million that's then offset by a positive 5.7. So, of course, under, uh, under law, when you adopt a budget, it has to be in balance. So if you look at the original budget, you could actually see that your expected revenues compared to what you expected to spend, you expected to spend more than, than the revenues you have. So under the law, you have to adopt a balanced budget. So therefore, what you did was what we call appropriating fund balance. Your fund balance is your savings account. You took $5.7 million from your savings account and said, I'm going to balance my budget that way. So it's like if you had your, you know, a home budget and you know that you make $50,000, but you add up, you know, all your things that you're spending on, rent and college and food and insurance, everything, and you say, hey, I'm going to spend $60,000, but I only make fifty. dollars That's going to be a problem. So luckily, let's say you had money in a savings account. Maybe you had $50,000 in a savings account. You said, well, this year I'll take $10,000 from my savings account, and that's how I'll pay my, my bills that year. Well, you could do that that year, and then if the same thing happens year after year, eventually your savings account goes away, mm -hmm. right? And then you have to figure out how to balance the budget without a savings account. That's what I believe Ken mentioned a little earlier, that because of what I'm going to show you as a depletion in the fund balance, you don't have that savings account anymore to balance your spending plan. So what do you have to do? You either have to raise other revenues, which the only one you really control is property taxes, or you have to cut spending to get your budget in balance or something you know, in between. So that's a very important thing, and we'll see that uh, on the next slide. So you used $5.7 million of your savings account to balance your spending plan. That was revised during the year due to various circumstances that it was thought that we had to use $7.3 million of our savings account to balance the budget. So what you see now in the actual column is fund balance actually declined by $5.6 million this year. So you did a little better you know, in certain things than budget. With the encumbrances, it, it, it didn't come out good. It was a negative uh, variant situation. And again, part of the reason the fund balance declined by 5.6, again, has to do with the property tax uh, revenue not coming in as expected and the state aid not coming in. So essentially, your savings account, which started the year with just over $20 million in it, as you can see, ended the year with about $15.2 million. What's really important is the next slide. If, if all of my dozen slides here, th this is really the most important. Fund balance, as I said, is your savings account. But your savings account is divided into many different, what I call, pots of money. You see last year the total was the $20 million, and this year at the bottom you see the total is $15 million. 
it doesn't mean that, hey, we got 15 million, we could just do it, what we want with it. The district in the past, in the first uh, group of uh, numbers up there, is what's called restricted fund balance. So all of these uh, components of fund balance are established either under the general municipal law or the education law of New York State. But none of these can, can be established without board action. So whatever action that the board has taken for these was in accordance with uh, education or, or general municipal law. And you could see of your total ending fund balance this year of 15.2 million, you have about 6.7 million, or just under half of it, set aside for specific things. And these, amount, these different uh, categories can only be used for those items. So you have money now set aside for tax certiorari payments. That's when you have to make a refund of property taxes. That's down to 670,000, whereas last year it was a million four. So that was utilized this year to help pay some of the certiorari expenses that came through. You have an employee benefit accrued liability piece. That's for vacation and sick time that's owed to employees. And it's split into two lines because you actually use 90,000 of that in your budget that you're in now for 22, 23. You said, we'll use some of our fund balance that's earmarked to pay vacation and sick time, and we're going to use that to help pay the vacation and sick time that's going to occur this year in 22-23. Then you have another two lines for retirement system contributions. This is money for the employee's retirement system. You split it up, and in total you have about 493000 but again, you've used 160000 of that to help pay your retirement bill in 22-23. And when I say that, that means if you decided not to use that, you would have had to raise taxes an additional 160000 to fund uh, the payment to the retirement system. So you took money out of savings in, in, the, in the budget that you're in now. Small amount for unemployment benefits. Then there's a significant amount of money uh, set aside for debt service, uh, a total of about $5.1 million. You, you, you're using a million thirty of that in balancing your plan for this year. So this money, when you put your budget together each year, a portion of your budget is to pay debt service, money that the district has borrowed for capital construction and various other things. You now have to pay those bonds back. Uh, you now have this pot. It can only be used to offset debt service. You can't use it to hire people. You can't use it for extracurricular. It is locked. Uh, only available to pay your debt service costs. And then a small amount uh, that's left in, in for workers' compensation claims. So again, a total of 6.7 of your 15 million of fund balance is earmarked, can't be used for, for any other purpose. The next group of fund balance, as you can see, is assigned fund balance. So what this means is the first uh, grouping under there is purchases on order. These are the encumbrances. So you had planned to buy a desk, you budgeted for it this year, but the supplier was late, didn't get you the desk by the end of the year. So it's not an expense that can be recognized, but you had the purchase order because you didn't budget for that desk this year. So in order to roll that authorization that you had in 21-22 to 22-23 when the desk shows up, those are uh, what we call purchase orders. And so the district had this year almost $2 million worth of purchase orders, and I would guess now that we're six, seven months into the new year, um, I'm going to assume that most of that uh, purchase order has been uh, spent. Then another very key number. Again, five and a half million dollars of your fund balance was used to balance your 22-23 spending plan. So you went to the voters with a budget for this year that we're in now, but your revenues that were in that budget were this five and a half million dollars short. You plan on spending more, and you said we'll use our savings account. So that, that's a critical, uh, critical number to, to notice. So when you add up all the things that I labeled with a one in parentheses, including the five and a half million, for the budget that you're in this year, you use 6.7, almost 6.8 million of your fund balance to balance this year's spending plan. Okay, so you have about a $260 million budget. You estimated essentially 
253 million in revenues, and you balanced it using this fund balance. So what the issue is, is if everything comes in as you budgeted, you spend every dollar that you budgeted and the revenues come in, your fund balance will decline 6.8 million this year. When I come here next year to do this, if that happened, your fund balance would go from 15 million down to eight or nine million dollars. So that's very important. And what's even more important is the very number, next number from the bottom, the unassigned fund balance. That's the free and clear money. So it's your total fund balance minus the set-asides that you see there. And this is the number that I believe Ken mentioned earlier uh, in his uh, discussions, that this district now only has $1 million in its fund balance. I have some percentages there in parentheses. That $1 million represents about 0.38% of your 23 budget, whereas last year, that 9.3 million represented 3. Point, almost 3.6 percent of this year's budget. New York State allows school districts to have 4 percent in this category of fund balance, in addition to all those other balances. So 4 percent of your budget is somewhere in the neighborhood, and I think Ken said it earlier, of somewhere around 11 million dollars. So you only have 1 million in there. Again, this was partially caused because if the city had remitted the 11.7 million that was talked about earlier of taxes from 2020 and prior, that would have been in your revenues. Your total fund balance, instead of being 15 million, would have been about 26 million, and you would have had you know, 10 to 11 million dollars uh, available in that unassigned line, which would have put you near the 4% max, and most likely, would not have been in the fiscal stress report that I know just came out a couple of days ago. Uh, there's other factors that go into that fiscal stress report because they do do a trend analysis to like, okay, well, what was your fund balance three years ago, two, one year ago? You know, how is it trending? How's your cash position? And various other, it's a complex formula. So, but <coughs> most likely it would not have elevated you to, to that top stress level. So that is something, obviously, I heard about it being talked about here earlier. You know, obviously, that's something that, you know, that does have to, you know, get resolved uh, between, between you folks and the city. So what's also important is you're going into budget season right now for putting your budget together for 23-24. So this year, as I said, you use $6.7 million to balance this budget, 22-23. Well, now... You had five and a half million of that six seven was essentially an unassigned fund balance last year. Now you only have one million. So you already start off the new budget cycle like four and a half million dollars in the hole. Because you don't have that right now. Unless, you know, the, this this tax uh, matter gets gets resolved. So this is a very important slide of all the slides that I am uh, talking about. We'll go through the next slide relatively quickly. Uh, one of the things that gets reflected in the financial statements, but not in the general fund that we just talked about, is post-employment benefit liabilities. So you provide your employees uh, health benefits when they retire. You pay for you know a, a rather large portion of those benefits. The district hires an actuary to calculate what that future obligation is and present value it back into today's dollars. So the concept is if you have a 25-year-old teacher working today, if they work 30 years, they're going to be entitled to, to health benefits in 30 years. What this calculation does is it attempts to estimate what health insurance will cost in 30 years and then present value that discounted back to today and say that that's going to be your future liability because the employee worked for you for those 30 years. So for this district, it did go down from, from last year because certain assumptions changed, but it's still a $334 million uh, obligation. It really doesn't mean anything. Each year you budget what we call pay as you go. Whatever your premiums are for health insurance, you just pay them. And that's what's budgeted each year. But this is what's considered a long-term uh, liability. Also in your books, again, not in the general fund, we have to report your share of the state pension plans for the employee's retirement system and the teacher's retirement system. Uh, they go somewhere else in your report. 
So the good news is, in the third bullet, uh, the employee's retirement system that was valued as of March 22 actually reflected by their actuaries an $8.2 billion net pension asset. Last year, it was a $99 million liability. Your share of that, based on your percentage of you know, your employees to the statewide total, is your share of that $8.2 billion asset is $3.7 million. We just reflect that on the financial statements. You can't touch it. There's, there's nothing you can do with it. It just has to be reported. For the teacher's retirement system, their actuaries uh, at June reported a $17 billion pension asset up from a $2 billion pension liability uh, the year before. And that's because of stock market gains and, and all their funds that, that they've invested. And your share of that uh, pension asset is, again, $99 million. It basically doesn't mean anything, but it's a big number. If somebody looks at your financial statements in certain sections, it, it's just required to be reported. So the last part uh, of what I want to talk about are some of the things that I mentioned when I started uh, about categorizing what we consider uh, deficiencies in your, in your systems here. And we have to categorize them under auditing standards in one of three categories as a material weakness, a significant deficiency, or the lowest level as a control deficiency. So the next slide has uh, the findings that we had this year. So this year, we identified uh, four uh, areas that we felt uh, were material weaknesses uh, in the district's operations. Ultimately, the first one is really the most important, the audit readiness and financial records. Uh, there are several vacancies at top levels in the business office. Uh, you know, there hasn't been, you know, until recently, you know, a, a treasurer or a deputy treasurer, you know, who would work under a Ken business official, uh, you know, to make sure that, that, you know, things are being done right. And currently what you, you do is you have a, uh, an outside uh, contractor who is helping uh, do the, you know, do the, the, the books here, close the books at the end of the year. Uh, but, you know, they're not full time. Uh, but they were very helpful uh, with, uh, you know, getting the audit done. We worked with, with her, with, with Ken, and, and other folks in the accounts payable office and, and payroll office to, you know, to understand what was going on. But uh, that's really something the district does need to address. You are basically a, almost a $300 million operation here. You need the appropriate, uh, you know, qualified people in high-level positions in payroll, in, you know, purchasing and claims and in, you know, essentially bookkeeping and accounting and, and, and doing all that to ensure that, you know, what's being reported is, 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 is correct. Uh, there was like, and because of, uh, you know, some of those issues, some of these other things came out. BOCES aid, uh, the district gets about seven, eight million dollars in revenue each year through BOCES, uh, through basically state aid. Uh, they were sending money here by check. Uh, and when the outside, uh, you know, uh, consultant was, was going through the books and we were going through it, we saw, hey, there's zero in, in BOCES revenue. What's going on? Well, it turned out somehow the checks that they sent never got here or they got lost or whatever, and this is millions of dollars. And because, you know, there's no treasurer day to day to say, hey, if I look at my monthly reports, why is my BOCES revenue zero? We determined, you know, we were, we were in touch with BOCES. You know, we were all on a call together. BOCES went and looked at their records. They saw the checks hadn't cleared, which is a good thing. So they voided those checks immediately and now put you on an ACH where they will wire the money when it's due to you. And so now all of this money has been received and reflected in, in the financial statements. But again, this goes back to not having, you know, folks in those positions to analyze those things and, and figure out what's going on. There was also a problem in June where the district actually overpaid payroll taxes to the IRS and New York State, I believe to the tune of about $10 million or so. So some of the payroll at the end of the year where the teachers get what we would call multi-pay or, or summer pay, uh, some of those payments to the IRS just got duplicated. So 
that was discovered, I guess, you know, early on in July, and the only way to essentially get it back and recoup it was once school resumed in September and the payroll was, you know, going again, that you did now not pay the IRS, you know, even though there was money due on that payroll because you worked down uh, the overpayment. And I believe at this point that's all been uh, recovered. So again, having the appropriate folks at the top level in, in payroll would, would really help to make sure that that, that didn't happen. And then there was also, uh, even though you know we listed as material weaknesses, there was some issue with registering new employees with the employees' retirement system or the teachers' retirement system. And if they're not registered appropriately, eventually, when you know they get credit for the time served, you're going to have to make up pension payments that maybe were not made because they weren't registered. So you know that process has to be looked at and make sure that when new employees join uh, the district that they're immediately registered uh, in the retirement system so they, they get credit for their uh, service. As I mentioned, we did not put anything in the middle category of deficiencies. And then we just identified a couple of what we call minor uh, control deficiencies. There are some old monies that are owed to the district, about $607,000. And there's some unearned revenue, what we call deferred revenue, of $350,000. Uh, much like most school districts, we usually have a comment on the extra classroom activities uh, because those don't really run through the business office. They're run at the, at the school levels by uh, advisors. And on some of the schools that we looked at, uh, some of the extra classroom activities uh, for, our, for our purposes were missing some certain uh, su uh, supporting documentation to back up uh, you know, disbursements that were made. Uh, some, uh, some schools did not uh, prepare monthly bank reconciliations timely, or their annual uh, summarization of uh, activity for the year. And there were also a bunch of inactive clubs, and under the Commissioner of Education, if there's an inactive club, uh, the money is supposed to be transferred like, to the student organization and then you know, reallocated for, for different stuff. There were some inactive accounts in what we call the Special Purpose Fund uh, of about 90000 sitting in there. Uh, we were unable to find certain payroll tax filings related to one quarter of the year. Uh, also, again, because of you know, some of the personnel issues, uh, we, we didn't see all proper approvals for, for adjusting uh, what we call journal entries uh, to the books. Uh, payroll change reports, we would, we would like to see those generated. So what that is, is... Uh, it's, it's a report that shows changes from one pay period to the next. And it, it kind of would summarize, like, why did this person's pay get changed this period? And it's an easier thing for somebody to review to say, hey, why did we change this person's pay? Up, down, sideways, whatever it was. So we suggest that that you know, report be generated so somebody could see what changes occurred from the previous pay and you know, sign off and, and approve that. Uh, there was a portion of your taxes that's actually due to the library, uh, and that was not paid as of June 22. I think that was about $100,000 or so. Uh, so uh, that has to happen. And then one month of claims under the child nutrition program for federal you know, and state reimbursement uh, did not match the amounts that you report uh, differently through, through NYSED. Uh, I believe that was being worked on, corrected. It wasn't, uh, you know, a significant uh, situation. Uh, so lastly, um, just to understand the filing requirements uh, for the school district, uh, the education law actually required that the audit report be filed with, in the, uh, with the state education department in their electronic portal by October 15th. They say October 15th, but there's really a 30-day grace period uh, if not filed by the 15th. So in reality, it's really November 15th. But we push everybody to get their uh, audit reports uploaded uh, to the uh, uh, state ed by October 15th. However, if it's not filed by November 15th, my understanding at least is that state aid due to the district in December could be withheld pending receipt of the audit report. And this district gets a significant amount of state aid. We don't want stuff uh, withheld. So based on the issues going on in the finance uh, business office and, and 
you know, the lack of, of the personnel that we would like to see there and having to utilize an outside, you know, consultant to help with the books, uh, the audit report uh, didn't get issued till about December 15th and then was filed uh, with NYSED. I don't know if it impacted state aid payments or not. It did not. So, so that, that's a good thing. So you did get your state aid payments. Um, sometimes they do threaten that. And then, of course, lastly, uh, and I think it's on the agenda tonight, uh, one of the other filings that the district must do is uh, to submit uh, its resolution that you've accepted the audit report, the management letter of the material weaknesses and, and control deficiencies, the extra classroom report, and you submit that uh, to New York State through the, uh, the NYSED uh, portal. So uh, I believe, hopefully, if this is accepted tonight, uh, Ken uh, will be able to upload that and, and meet that filing requirement. So that was a lot of stuff. Um, so I'd be glad to take any comments or questions. Can you hear me? When was the audit completed and um, submitted to the board members? We completed the audit. It was dated December 15th, and so we, uh, we submitted <coughs> it to Ken at, at that point in time. I don't know. So it was submitted on December 15th? Uh, it might have been. Well, it's dated December 15th. It might have maybe December 20th, you know, for production and, and, and so forth. And do you usually uh, report to the board before you present in a general meeting? Sometimes the school board will ask, uh, or they, they formed an audit committee, and you know we can discuss uh, the you know the audit report in an audit committee before. Uh, we had some informal discussions, but I, I don't think we had a formal audit committee meeting on this. No. So we just saw this like Thursday of last week as a board. Yeah, that I, that I would defer. I, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to committee reports. Committee reports. Trustee Dale, anything for the committee? Trustee Jinka? No. Trustee Adesoli? Um, the policy committee met, and uh, we are just continuing to look at the policies that are, that are in the manual right now. However, it's taking a little bit more time than we had expected because it has not been done in many years, and the wording had to, we had to revise the wording so that it was really, the policies now are customized to the activities that we have now. And so looking at the goals of the district, and trying to make sure that the policies are lined up with those goals and that the policies support the goals. So it's the goals that are the framework and then we have the policies. So we were able to look at um, basically those policies that address bullying, intimidation, harassment, and uh, discrimination. So we're, we're kind of right there. And hopefully by the end of February we'll be pretty much finishing up and ready to put it onto uh, the internet for everybody to see. Okay, that's about it. Anything else, Lana? No. no. Okay. That's about it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Education. Education. Were you there? <laughs> you may speak. <laughs> I, will, I will permit you to speak. <laughs> Cool. So, um, good evening. The budget committee um, met last week, and um, so we are going over the budget for 2022-2024 um, school year. 
so far we have um, a handful of um, building principals who have not um, uploaded their, their expenses in the um, portal yet. And then we have some principals that overstated um, their um, expenses. So um, we're waiting on those. Uh, could you hear me? Sorry. Sorry. Oh, it's off. Sorry. Okay, so we are waiting on those expenses to review. Um, well, first he has to go to um, the superintendent and her cabinet, and then it's come to us. Also, we are looking at um, the expenses for transportation and for um, security, uh, for, some, for security, and also for our food services. So we will be meeting, um, the budget committee will be meeting on Monday, coming Monday, to go over the budget again before um, Mr. Silver presented to the public in February. Thanks. We're going to go to Trustee Adams. Um, I'm always put on the spot. Yes. I, f I, f I feel bad because it's not that the problems aren't there. It's that, you know, I bring them up to the board, and the board usually, th they try to solve them. They're on their way. As we can see, a lot of the problems lie outside of the board. So um, just participate, support our Mount Vernon uh, Teachers Union, and um, come to Parent Involvement <coughs> Day on February 13th. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. <laughs> Security meeting about a week and a half ago on Monday. Uh, we had, at that security meeting we had just gone over uh, just the various improvements that have been going on, finishing the cameras at the high school, moving on to the other schools. Uh, we also I brought up at the meeting just to see if we can keep pushing for SROs from the city, which they seem to be uh, not wanting to assist, but they have a manpower shortage over there as well. Um, that's really the gist of the security meeting. There's, uh, we've had two facilities meetings over the last two weeks. Uh, I didn't attend the one on Monday, which was just yesterday. However, uh, to give you a briefing on what we've been speaking about, was uh, Mr. Botros has been uh, making his rounds to communicate more with the uh, staff within the within the buildings. Uh, we discussed the damage that was done at the high school over uh, the winter. The Lincoln cafeteria renovation, the cooling tower at Lincoln, a lot of things at Lincoln, um, as w and as well as the uh, the, other, not the, the cooling tower at Lincoln, yeah, the, the, the roof, the cooling tower, the facade, all, all Lincoln, uh, and as well as uh, the turf at Mount Vernon High School. And that's mostly it. There's a whole lot, but that's pretty much the main points. So the, um, the issue at Lincoln, the facade, um, we are getting that repaired over the summer. What, when is that going to be fixed? I believe they're still in the process of figuring out exactly how and when that's going to occur because they have to bring the, get contractors to bid it out and uh, go for it. And they also figure out what to do first because the facade is weakened by water that's coming in uh, along the edge of the roof. So it may uh, involve other things being done prior to doing the facade. And then Lincoln had, is there an issue with the air conditioning over there as well? Yes. That that's another issue. That's what I was saying. The cooling tower, they have Lincoln for a, new, for a building which is newer than some of our other buildings seems to have a lot of issues. Uh, like I said, they're all kind of in line, but in the way of others. You know, you can do there's you can do air conditioning, uh, but there's also issues with the roof. So if it was if it wasn't a school system and we didn't have you know money concerns, one would uh, do things in a certain order. But right now, it's more in the way of what is a priority for safety, security, and so that we can open again for next year. So did we ever get the issue straightened at Williams? Which one? The one that you, you and 
Also, uh, they are for the buildings. Um, we're trying to clear out the space at the high school, so there's an online auction for the HVAC, the equipment from the old shops that uh, is live. Uh, so I think it ends February 6th. That money will all go to the district that's raised from auctioning off that equipment. And it's Mr. Silva, is it AARP? Is he here? <laughs> what is the name of the auction company? No, no, I just wanted. No, okay, well, it is. It, is it on our website? I know it's on. The name, so that if people are interested yeah. in bidding. Yes. Okay, okay, so that, just to let you know that. All right, Trustee are you done? I am done. Trustee Trustee Kelly? Update on the initiative, the entrepreneur initiative with Iona University. Uh, they are scheduled uh, to visit Mount Vernon High School. The I think there are 10 mentor students from the University of Iona that will be working with Ms. Romanelli, Romanelli's class of 24 students. Um, and they will be meeting for the first time ever. So it's, it, it looks like an exciting opportunity for the students. And hopefully we'll update you as things once the visit happens, we'll have more information. That's just one class. Well, they're the uh, there's a, they're, they are coming uh, to my own uh, university. With, I don't know how many students are there. They're 10 mentors. And, and so they're going to talk about entrepreneurship. And then our students are going to go to my own university and look at some of this stuff and talk about entrepreneur, their entrepreneur program. And at some point, we're going to have a shark tank. Hope is to have a shark tank. They're going to invent some things. We're going to have a shark tank uh, episode. We should have that film. And uh, we're going to have a pop Very exciting. Shows, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. White, I'm very excited. I had an education meeting. And, and I was very excited um, with the ELL -E program. What we have now, which we'll be starting next week, is a new program called Microsoft Translator. And children that speak any kind of language will be able to hear their teacher in their own language. And when they respond back, they'll respond back in their language, and the teacher will uh, be able to understand them in English. It's very exciting. It's going to start next week. Twelve teachers have already been selected. Um, the schools that they will be um, in is Malvern High School, Everett Williams, Graham, Hamilton, and a few more. Lincoln, I believe. And Columbus. I said Hamilton, didn't I? Yeah. And Columbus. So it's an excellent opportunity for them. They'll feel connected to the classroom because what they hear will be in their language that they understand what the teacher is saying. Mm. They'll each be wearing uh, headphones. Mm. That's nice. exciting to see. Yeah. yeah. Is that going to mm -hmm. um, hinder them from learning English as well? I don't think it will hinder them from learning English, but when they first come here, it will make them feel included and, and want to be in that class because most of the time I've, I had kids that came from Brazil and not a word of English, and they just sit there. Unless I had a, another kid from that same country that can interpret for them. But this way they can go and listen to everything. <coughs> so it's, it's a fantastic program. And I hope we get to, somebody, some of us will get to see it. Let us know when they come. They start next week. So, mm -hmm. um, Ms. Cicello, I'm Cicello. Mm -hmm. Cicello um, will let us know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Oh yeah, yeah that mm -hmm. would be nice. Mm -hmm. And and we also talked about the power hour from grades three to eight. They are really concentrating on three standards power hour. Is it two hours after school each day? Uh, no, no, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. I'm sorry. Um, and they're concentrating on three math standards that they have found to be very important, especially on this um, the math test that comes up at the end of the year. Excellent. So they're working hard. They are, it's, they're encouraging all the teachers to break up into groups. So we have the intervention group that needs the more help. Then you have your own level group, and then you have your... Um, advanced group mm -hmm. in each class. So ELA and um, math power hour is really working out. It's mm -hmm. very strong and they're, very, they're really going to prove that they, the, uh, those kids are going to master this master pro, this testing coming up. Good. Um, I don't have any um, huh? reports. I was on the policy committee. No. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. I was on the policy committee, so that was already reported. So other than that, I don't have any any other committees to report. So we'll go to um, old business. Old business? Mm -hmm. Any old business, anyone? We can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, old business? There's no old business. <laughs> so we'll go right into the um, resolution. Yeah. Resolutions, um, Human Resources, 6.1. Can I have a motion for approval of Human Resources Resolution? Certified. Motion. I need one more. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for 6.2, approval of human resources resolution 75B, classified? Motion. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Let's congratulate. Motion, motion carries. Can congratulate. Um, congratulate our seniors. Can we pull their names? We have um, Miss Abby. Miss Abby, congratulations. Miss Abby. Miss Abby. 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 Congratulations, Miss Abby. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say anything? Thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to this district. I've invested a lot of time here. Thank you. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores. Congratulations, Mr. Flores. <laughs> You do, do you want? And uh, happy that the pool has been supported and open ever since we were in 2017. We have a lot of students. That's uh, Frazier. Is, what? Is that Ms. Frazier or Mr. Frazier? S. Frazier. S. Frazier. Yeah. Shannon? Yes. Is she here? No. Congratulations. Uh, Kay Morris? Kay Morris here? Well, congratulations to Kay Morris for the tenure. I think that's it. Thank you all. Okay. This well, one. She has a mistake. Ariel. Ariel Redding. Ariel? Oh, that's that name's not. Mm -hmm. Ariel Redding. Ariel Redding, is she here? Well, congratulations to her. Uh, 
Okay, I have a motion for 6.3, approval to establish the title senior cashier. Motion. Second. Um, what was that? Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Abstain? Motion carries. Curriculum and instruction. Can have a motion for 7.1 authorization to hire staff to conduct a pre K after school and Saturday workshop? Motion. Second. Okay. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. We can have. You may see Dr. White. You may oh, say right. something. Okay, because that's what I just said. Oh, you want to? Does she want to speak? No, it's okay. She's fine. Anybody have any questions for her? She would have to answer it. We can make a question. <laughs> <laughs> she want a question? Seven. Is it seven point two? Uh, so now we're on to seven point two. Can I have a motion for approval of a replacement staff and substitute in academic power hour programs and RTI school team at Rebecca Turner School? Motion. Second. Second. Uh, who's that? Jeff. Jeff. Okay. Motion. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Oppose? Abstain? Motion carries. I have a motion for 8.2, authorization for Benjamin Turner School to travel to New Jersey. Motion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Red. Yes. Mm -hmm. Questions, concerns, discussions? I have a question. I was going to ask the same question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just had a question. It's a Saturday trip. Is this a school trip? Is Is this... Organized by the school. Um, it's organized. Tickets were given to the school um, to a, a counselor, um, and then she selected students to go to the school. So she raised money for the busing in order to have the students go as well. So my question, and it's a question. Um, so do they need a resolution from the school district? Since it's a Saturday trip, I'm just curious. It's not part of a program. It's Yes, but they're using our students. Um, so this, therefore, we, we decided to put a resolution through, and we also went through the, the district council for that as well. Okay. And they gave and us the, that. And, and will the teacher also be paid through the district for her time? No. no. Teacher's not getting paid. Why not? Volunteer. It's volunteer. Just volunteer. The teacher volunteer. So she's volunteering. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just trying to understand how things are done. He said the HBCU. No, no, I know it's HBCU. I just was, it was the Saturday thing that I was, and the fact that it was, money was raised, and then, so I was just trying to understand why a resolution had to be done. That's it. Yeah, why do we need a resolution? So motion's on the floor. Motion's on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Motion carries. I have a motion for student services 9.1. Approval of student services, pupil personnel services, memorandum number 13, dated January 31st. Yep. I need a motion. Oh. Okay. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Wait, I have oh. a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for the Special Olympics, is this the first time they're doing it in the district? Oh. Okay. That was my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Abstain? Motion carries. <coughs> Can I have a motion on their business office for 10.1? Authorization for approval to establish a claims committee. Second.
and second is. Okay. Um, questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. We have a motion for 10.2, authorization for statement of unpaid taxes to the city. Motion. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for approval for the settlement tax proceedings for Renaissance Arms Properties Corp? Motion. Second. Second. Okay. <laughs> Questions, concerns, discussions? Um, just want to understand what these are. Mr. Silver. Mr. Sorry, what is your question? Um, the settlement tax proceedings, I guess. Just, can you just explain? This is a certiorari. This is a reduction in assessment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for 10.4? Authorization to accept the annual audit for the 2022-2023 school year. Motion. Second. Excuse me. I think you need to add those couple of words that are on the bottom of page 11 of the auditor's presentation having to do with it's supposed to include management letter and extra classroom report in that resolution. So if that could be understood. So it's the audit. Extra, it's everything that you received when you sat down tonight has to be accepted. So, so do we pull we it, it or do, do we pull it, it or do we just no, no, no. add it? Oh, we just, we just add, add it. A couple of words okay. To it, okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for 10.5 approval of Sirini and Associates LLP as consultants for grant audit? Motion. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Uh, uh, Abstain? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for 10.6, approval of general funds transfer? 2022-2023, January 31st, 2023. Motion. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? I have a question. Um, Mr. Silva, was, were these uh, transfer um, done previously? Because I remember um, we oh, approved. There were similar transfers to these. The, the state requires us to have a multitude of small budget codes. We tried to combine them a few years ago so that we wouldn't have to do this. So we have to transfer from roofing to HVAC rather than being able to have fewer codes and a much easier way to do this. But any time we need to move money, it needs to be before you because it has reached that threshold. But no, we have not done these before. So the, these, dollar, this, amount, the dollar amount was not approved before for these it, transfers? The, the, the dollar amount may have been approved, but it was a different transfer. It could, have, it could have been the same dollar amount for a different time. These have not been done before. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Abstain? Motion carries. Henderson is Can I have a motion for 10.7, approval of stipend for Linda Hen Henderson as tax collection associate? Motion. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? 
I do have some concerns here, um, only because they seem to have, the stipends seem to have been brought up by one of our employees and one of our, uh, appears to be a union rep, I'm unsure. I won't bring up the name because I don't believe I'm allowed to bring up people's names. Um, first, let me preface my statement by saying I'm all for getting everything done we can that the district needs to get done. And in a case like this, we obviously do need to have someone to collect the taxes. But it appears from what was stated earlier that we're getting rid of a whole bunch of stipends due to the fact that they're I'm going to say they're either in violation of civil service law or the collective bargaining agreement between the district and CSEA. Do we know if they're in violation, if these stipends are in fact in violation of either of those? Hello. Um, so we met with the commission, um, we as in Dr. Ben Conroy, Mr. Silver, and myself, and the stipends that we are removing this evening are not in the collective bargaining agreement, and they do not fall under civil service law because if you want a stipend, it has to be in there. Nonetheless, the district, when we began collecting taxes, sought approval from the Civil Service Commission to stipend individuals to collect the taxes. They said that is the only stipend we may continue at this time because, as you see, we have a new position being adopted. And so we, once we negotiate the salary with civil service and are able to fill the position, then we will no longer be allowed to have the stipend positions. But we have temporary permission because they said that's something that we have to do. And so when we first began collecting taxes, I think in 2020 or 2021, we received permission from the commission for that position. So it's the only stipends position we can have at this time, and outside how, of the contract. How long do we have permission for the stipend rather than negotiating with CSEA or whoever we have to in order to get that position? So we have a position that was approved tonight, senior cashier. It was approved first by the Mount Vernon Civil Service Commission. It's approved by you this evening. The negotiating piece with civil service is simply on salary. So once they agree to a salary, then we'll be able to fill it. So uh, hopefully that's going to happen. We're back and forth in email communication at this time. Um, so once we have someone doing that position, then we can no longer use the stipend position because it's going to be a full-time salaried position. And what I'm saying is, it's, I don't know, something seems ambiguous here. Are we... We have the, we have a, it appears that the city civil service has approved the position, correct? The senior cashier position to collect the taxes. To collect correct. the taxes. And then, obviously, it's up for a vote tonight. And then, you say you're speaking with CSEA at this point in time. Is that for the stipend or is that for the position? For the salary for the position. The salary for the position. Right. Okay. That's the piece that... In the civil service contract, we have to negotiate the salary with civil service. Okay. With, with civil service itself? Yeah. Okay. Well, with the district with, unit. With the CBO from? Yeah. The C CBU, yeah. excuse me. Okay. Okay. Well, I would just like to I don't know, go on record saying that I, I really, uh, anything that's out, I come from being a union leader. Anything that's outside of a collective bargaining agreement that we've signed or we have some form of an agreement with the people who take care of our district, which are the, really the people who are the backbone of the district, I don't think we should go against anything that's against either a collective bargaining agreement or uh, civil service law. If, by chance, if that is what has happened and this is approved, then so be it. But in the future, I really, I guess that's why we're getting rid of all these other stipends. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Aye. Abstain? Aye. Motion carries.
to have a motion for 10.8, authorization to end stipend for deputy treasurer. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Oppose? Abstain? Abstain. Aye. 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 <laughs> so I'm just gonna Sorry, I just have to remove everybody's vote here. So. Okay. Abstain? Did everybody yes. abstain? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Motion fails. Can I have a motion for 10.9, authorization to end stipend for asbestos designee? Motion. Okay. <laughs> Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Abstain? Aye. 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 Nancy, you, you. Sorry? All those in favor? I'm in favor of okay. ending. Motion fails. Can I have a motion for 10.10, .10, authorization to end stipend for print shop district-wide printing, senior typist. Motion. Motion. Second. Okay. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Oppose? Abstain? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Motion fails. Can I have, an, uh, can I have a, a motion for authorization to end stipend for Capital Project State Coordinator? Motion. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Oppose? Aye. Oppose? Oh, no. Okay. Abstain? Abstain. Aye. Motion fails. Can I have a motion for 10.12, authorization to accept a donation from Linda Horan Dolan? Motion. Okay. Second. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion carries. Can I have a motion for 10.13, authorization to accept a donation from Westchester Aquatic Club for Mount Vernon High School. Motion. Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? Who All is who is Westchester Aquatic Club? What, what, where did they come from? Mr. Flores, you want to tell us who's Westchester Aquatic Club? Sure. Okay, so the Westchester Aquatic Club is a USA-based swim club that is currently using our facility as a practice location. Uh, they were brought upon uh, during COVID because of all clo uh, locations that were closing, so we had a COVID plan for them uh, with distancing and everything. But since the program has been successful and working, has been opened up to Mount Vernon residents as well to join their team. 
uh, we've continued our partnership with them. So they are now uh, giving us monthly donations or helping us replace any equipment that we need at our pool also as a thank you for letting us, letting us, or letting them use our facility. So it's, uh, they started their donations back in October and once a month they would say to us, do we need any equipment? We let them know if there's anything that they could donate to us or anything like that. So, so, so do they rent the pool? They do rent the pool from us. So the, and that's put towards the maintenance of the pool? In addition, they're gifting us money? Correct. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Motion carries. I have a motion for 10.14, authorization for the Pennington PTA to accept a book donation from United Way of Westchester and Putnam. Motion. Second. Okay. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Okay. Motion carries. We have a motion for 10.15 authorization to declare computer slash network equipment unusable and obsolete for the purpose of discard. Motion. Uh, Second. Questions, concerns, discussions? Yes, how do we know? Uh, is there any other information that's been given to us for this disposable? Yes. Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez? Equipment has been deemed uh, You can come. Obsolete. You have to come. come. Oh. Oops, not a touch. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the equipment was already evaluated and deemed obsolete. It's older than five years in many cases, in, in some instances, even 10 and plus. So we actually removed these pieces of the equipment and uh, we actually replaced many of these in classrooms with interactive boards and everything during the beginning of this year. So this is the remaining of those. Mr. Ramirez, uh, do you auction any of the old equipment off? I'm just only, asking. only if the equipment is a whole. Okay, it so can these be, are pieces. It can be actually, these are pieces. These, these were parts, and we had to follow the procedure because they're all inventory. So we still have a service tag. This is the procedure where we follow. Thank you for the explanation. Not a problem. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Abstain? Motion carries have a motion for 10.16, authorization to dispose of excess equipment in the print shop at Mount Vernon High School. Motion. Second. Okay. Same question. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, concerns, discussions? Questions. Uh, the equipment that's being disposed of, is there any second life or auction? Because I know that... If you approve this to have this get put into that same room with the auction stuff. And we'll note that on our website as well. Thank you, Mr. Silva. That was it. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? <coughs> Abstain? Motion carries. We have a motion for 11.1, .1, authorization for appointment of audit committee members. Motion. Second. Who was the first? Okay. It's Jeff. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. We have a motion to enter into, for 12.1, to enter into executive session for the purpose of discuss the employment history of a particular person, current litigation, and collective bargaining with their CSEA. Motion. Okay. Questions, concerns, discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Do we, we have any other extent? actionables when we come out? No. no. So this, um, we will not be returning to the meeting. Oh, <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know. 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 I don't know.